Great. Well, welcome to RBCM at Home. My name is Kim Goff, and I'm a learning program developer at the Royal BC Museum. And I'm coming to you today from my office, which is located in the museum. And we are on the traditional territories of the Lekwungen, the Songhees and Esquimalt people in Victoria, British Columbia. And I extend my appreciation for the opportunity to live and to learn on this territory. And I know people are joining us from many different places, so I encourage you to consider the traditional territory of whose land you are on today. So RBCM at Home started a year ago when our museum and archive closed due to the pandemic. And it was an opportunity to talk to staff about what they were working on from home. Now that even the museum has reopened, we've continued this program as a way of staying connected with people at home or school around the province. And this program and previous ones have been recorded and you can find them on the Royal BC Museum's YouTube channel. So today is International Museums Day, and as such, we're going to revisit the early days of the Royal BC Museum. In 1886, a petition was presented that called for the need of a museum in BC to collect, preserve, and study objects and specimens from, specimens from BC and to inform the public about them. The home of the first museum was the BC Legislative Building, but in 1968-69, the collection moved to our current building, and our home on Belleville Street near the Inner Harbor. In the book, Circle of Time, the story of British Columbia's Provincial Museum, it states, the staff of the museum were energetic and dedicated to their jobs. This fact combined with the move into the new facilities stimulated their creativity. And one of those creative people is my guest today, Jan Vriesen. And Jan, I happen to have a copy of your job description from it's dated January, 1978. On it, you are listed as hired as a diorama artist, Museum Technician 3, responsible to Director of Exhibits, JJ Andre. And the outline of the position says, manufactures and installs exhibit components by performing duties as required by different and distinct phases of exhibit work, which include planning, field work, manufacturing, and installation, specializes in diorama background research design and painting. May direct, supervise, and train a small group of technicians for diorama projects of short duration. Does that sound familiar, Jan? <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you become someone qualified to paint giant dioramas in a museum? Tell me, what were you, what were you doing before you signed that contract at 1970? I was hired. Uh, as a carpenter's helper, uh, and it was it was under the I was one of the last ones hired under the LIP program, which was a local a local initiative program designed to help in, in in employ people. So I was wandering around and I was watching the local paint and the painter that they had at the time, Frank Beebe, paint these large images on walls, and I thought, what courage! Well, eventually he got tired of doing it and they needed one more done. And, and I said, well, I'll try this. And uh, survived the project and then was asked to um, uh, paint the largest walkthrough dioramas in the country at that time. But there were four years before this was happening. And I thought, why not? I might as well enjoy the new status that I had. I was no longer carrying lumber. I was now painting which of course is what I wanted to do to begin with. So and that's how I started. Yeah, you were an abstract painter, correct? Correct, yes, it was easier. No one could challenge you. I didn't have yeah. to worry about making things look correct. And uh, when I started on this, <laughs> my first diorama, Let's show, uh, I'll I learned a that- Let's picture of that. I'll show oh, okay. a picture of your first diorama here. There, we're looking at the Stikine diorama, which is on the third floor of the museum, and that's uh, in the area that talks about the fur trade. So, yeah, and this is your first one. This is my first one, and uh, I walked up to the wall, and there was this 19 by 19 foot wall challenging me, and I thought, oh, what have I done to myself? But I survived that one and uh, did everything that I had seen him do. So I thought, cool, and uh, I survived it. So you've got a 19 by 19 blank canvas, mm -hmm. uh, and it's also um, curved. Right, right. So where do you, it's where curved do you both ways. 
Right. So where the do you start? Curved. <laughs> where did I start? Oh, at that time, I actually made a grid on the wall and had gridded my uh, a model. But I found out since then that there are easier, easier ways of doing it. And then you start way in the horizon because that's the furthest away from the public and therefore the least to be criticized. And as you go come closer to the public, you have to get more and more correct. And uh, <laughs> yes, and survival is exactly the term on this one. <laughs> How long did it take? Oh, I had, I think, I think I had one month to do it or a month and a half. That was it. And are those like long, long days, Jan, or? Uh, and at some times, depending on the level of panic that I was in. <laughs> yes. So this is a, a scene uh, from the interior. Did you, were you working from a photograph or had you actually no, gone to visit? No, they like gave it? me a postcard to prove to them that I could paint in the first place. I copied the postcard, which was easy because a brush stroke is a mile. And uh, they agreed to it. And then I just took that photograph and basically put it on the wall. My goodness. Now, it did say in your job description that you were able to travel or that you would have to go visit some sites. Did you need to do that while you were? Oh, absolutely. Oh, well, that was one of our main ideas that if you were to do a particular exhibit and there were scenes involved, you actually had to go and see the scene to, um, I don't know, just to become more involved with it. Mm -hmm. So we did a lot of, a lot of wonderful uh, trips up and down this coast to plan and learn about what we were going to do in our next big project. So yes, this, this, this coast to be saw it on, on various, either by planes or boats or, oh, it was wonderful. Now, I think one of the places you went is here. Are you seeing this, this image, yeah? Oh, yes, the yeah. Triangle Island. So that's, tell folks where that is, because that's pretty remote. Most people probably haven't been there. This island that we had, that we went on, uh, is about 20 miles north west of the most northern tip of the main island, our island. And we stayed there for about a week, studying the environment. And at the same time, we were helping the scientists, scientists bird the, the, some of the birds that were there, bird species. And uh, so it was, again, one of those big, powerful trips that we went on to study what we were going to paint. And you must have been roughing it, I imagine, uh, in little tents or? Well, we had, you no, know, we had one shed that we were told to take down after we were leaving again. And it had been occupied uh, by them at, at when they were studying up there, but left it with full of food, uh, cans of foods and things. And mice had taken over. Mm. So uh, it, it was an interesting thing at night to deal with mice everywhere, <laughs> but it was it was okay. We were young and it didn't matter. <laughs> How many of you were on that uh, adventure? Uh, I think there were six of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there were six and of were, us. And sorry, were you ahead. paint? Were you painting while you were there, or were you no, taking photographs, no, no. or how were you committing this to your? Memory? I was just taking photographs. Mm. Easier to do and. Uh, I never actually expected to do the job. Four years, I thought I could be anywhere. So um, all these trips, uh, I took lots and lots of photographs and you do become known and uh, uh, involved with the landscape by being there. So you do get that information also. Mm -hmm. And then we made a big model when we came back. And um, after the model, we started painting on these large walls. Yes, this is the seawall on the second floor. And maybe people don't realize at first, but they're looking at um, not one place, but two places. I believe this scene is uh, to be Tofino. Is that right, Jan? Yes, we, I think we actually did about four various uh, habitats. The middle one, of course, is the Long Beach area with the, the beautiful beaches. And uh, the other end, the, the, the right end, we have a sea cave, <clears throat> and we did a lot of research in Bamfield. Okay. And then on the other end is the, uh, uh, the island with the, with the puffins on there, and uh, yeah. Right, so this is Bamfield, this area that we're looking at here. 
Yeah, towards the immediate left, yes. Mm -hmm. That's that's then Banfield. And then the transition goes into the Long Beach uh, area and then from there up to to Tron Island. Now this is mostly sky and water <laughs> because this right. is, what about the foreground? So what is the process? So here there's sand and rocks and uh, branches and, and birds. Mm -hmm. what, is, what is the order? Uh, is the foreground well, already first, there? And no, everything that the all the rocks and the tidal pool that was there is there and was all created down in the um, in the basement of the museum by a phenomenal team of individuals that most of them had been hired under the same program I was. And um, they created all these things and then I tried to copy what they created into the wall. Uh, the sand was interesting because we asked, first we put foam down, carved the foam into the various uh, subtleties and then sprinkled sand on top of that. And the, the nice thing about this one is that the foreground wall actually curves into the background wall. So it's difficult to see the seam. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at this photo and I'm trying to figure out which is the, the beach and which is the painting. <laughs> well, that's great. Photographs are much more forgiving. <laughs> <laughs> well, and lighting must have been a special part of all of this too, because when we, you were, must have been painting this in, in big bright light, but then there's when you go up and visit them now, it's more stage, there's more stagecraft involved. You know, there's darker lighting and well, things as well. Well, there was a time when I was actually hoping to get into stage design. Mm. And when I started working at the museum, we were doing, planning these big things. It was like doing stage design. And um, um, with, with the attention to detail, it really works well. Mm -hmm, absolutely. So from the beach, um, mm -hmm. I don't know if this one's in order, but uh, this is from our farm dioramas. People will recognize the horse. Uh, and right. It's there. Now you were telling me originally there was snow all over this diorama. There were big patches of snow. And uh, after years of being exposed to dust and deterioration, we decided to take the snow out and not put it back in. And so I had to try and paint the transition into the wall, uh, which at one time also was full of snow. But you can see the slight difference of the foreground to the background. Over time, of course, the foreground gets dustier and dustier and it loses that, loses that transition. So maybe one of these days I'll come back in and redo the transition again. Catch it up. <laughs> exactly. That's great. Um, one of the things we talk about on the tours and if people have been here, I, I think what these dioramas really help to do is to make a very immersive environment. As you said, Jan, you were, you were building the biggest walkthrough dioramas anywhere in the world mm -hmm. at that time. And that experience was enhanced by the lighting and the sound and also smells. Um, and mm -hmm. there are scents used in different areas of the ship, for example. Um, I often, I'm often glad there was no scent used at this exhibit because I think uh, it's already so realistic. If you could smell the manure in the farm, it would be quite <laughs> overwhelming. <laughs> in my imagination, I can though. I can sort of pick it up. <laughs> mm -hmm. Here we have uh, our gorgeous forest scene on uh, the second floor in the forest diorama. And these trees are fantastic. Were you, did you have a botany background? Uh, how? No, 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 I had no botany background at all. It came down to the point where I had to paint what they put in front of the wall. And, uh, and that was another learning curve because I, I'd never considered ever to paint realistically or try to. And all of a sudden I was painting large walls and tried to make them as realistic as possible, at least as far as I could. And uh, no, but it, it, the beauty is that the people downstairs, the team downstairs, they're the ones who made these things and they tried to make them look and act as if they were alive. Mm -hmm. So the attention to detail uh, was quite phenomenal. Yeah, so the team downstairs, Jan's referring to as our exhibit arts 
uh, technicians and they are mm-hmm. still in the basement after all of these years. And they're a really um, talented team of individuals who have expertise from fine art to sculpting to carpentry um, and everything in between, I think. And I, I've heard stories about the trees that they're actually fiberglass casts. So they went mm-hmm. to the forest and made casts of actual trees and then brought them back here so the the trees could be painted you you didn't paint the the fiberglass trees did you Jan just the background no 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 no. uh that was all done that was all done by the group downstairs Mm -hmm. and yeah and all that had to be collected and had to be uh uh, preserved and then uh, glued onto the actual barks so yeah it was quite a process right and back here in the um, this area where I'm moving my cursor around, yeah. you told me there used to be an additional special effect. So right oh, now yeah. the river has That's been right. turned off. But in order to, here? well, what happened was that they had water running in the foreground, and it was coming through a pumping system, and came from that spot back there behind that big rock, and then disappeared again once you get to the other end. And what we did behind there, we took, took uh, pins and attached clear plastic discs to them, had a fan behind one of those trees. And every now and then that fan would brush, the wind would brush over those and they would move. And it looked as if water was actually coming, flowing on the wall itself. So it was a, it was a nice trick that uh, the team uh, invented to, to do that. So I thought it was pretty cool and it worked really well. Lovely. Yeah. I love the fact that there's water, uh, actual water in the museum. It's a, a risky thing, uh, <laughs> but mm-hmm. it, it really has a beautiful effect. Uh, another beautiful forest scene here. This is just on the other side of the, um, of the grizzly bear where we're looking. Um, there's a cougar to the right and there's some deer here in the foreground. And I think those are Douglas firs in the background on the wall. Correct, and a cedar. The cedar on the, here, on the yeah. immediate left. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You were telling me yeah. you were you were painting a tree one day in this forest when JJ Andre came by. Yeah, <laughs> there have been mo- there were moments, of course, when I was trying to figure out how to paint all these things, where I would get into a panic stage and could not figure it out. And it was always, it was, it was not too good when somebody came up and made me aware of the fact that I had a problem. Unfortunately, Jean <laughs> only made that mistake. <laughs> and I snarled at him. And when I didn't come down for coffee at three o'clock in the afternoon, nobody came up because <laughs> I could easily have been in a snarly mood trying to figure things out. I spent three and a half years up there by myself trying to figure things out which in itself is pretty amazing. I don't think there's a museum in the world right now that can give someone three and a half years to find out if he can do it or not. Mm-hmm. Wow. So, but, in, but in the meantime, downstairs, everything was d- discovered. We discovered all kinds of different ways of doing things, techniques of casting and stuff that uh, was going on down below. So it was a busy time. Yeah, it's gorgeous, it's great to go. So one of my favorite dioramas in the museum, this is the Gold Rush diorama on the third floor. And um, I remember hearing that the sign of a really great diorama is when you're looking at it and you cannot tell where the foreground ends and the painting begins. And I challenge you looking at this picture uh, to do that. This is a scene uh, in the Barkerville area in Northern British Columbia. And the trees are all gone. They've been chopped down and left behind. And there's a great stormy sky, uh, lots of drama and color. You um, you mentioned you had an apprentice during this one, Jan. At the time, yes. Her name was Carol Christensen, and she was um, she was being uh, um, I mean, she was going to be trained to do take over the dioramas. But after this one, I was leaving. And so finally, while working on the model, uh, I said to her, go and paint some rocks in the far corner in the left. And then I went for lunch and I came back and she had painted rocks and I was stunned as to how well she had painted those rocks. 
which meant I had to, of course, now try and meet that expertise <laughs> I had unwittingly created a competition. She raised your Anyhow, <laughs> she did a wonderful job. And uh, it was nice. It was wonderful to work with her while, while we were doing these. Mm. And Carol Christensen is still uh, a practicing artist. And Oh, yes. Um, oh, yes, she is. We've, we've had the pleasure of working with her a little bit more uh, at the museum on some other projects. Um, so where did you go after this? This was your last one. Where did where were you taken to? After this, I uh, got the job to do the uh, murals uh, in uh, on Long Beach in, Wiccan in, in the Wiccan Inish Center. And I had a, a friend of mine from the museum out there working with me. Uh, and we were out there from, I think we were out there for two, three or four months on the beach. We had beautiful weather. And they had the whole redone building all to ourselves. It was great. Mm -hmm. So I survived that one, as did he. And uh, after that, we did the second one in that building, which was the Seabird mural one. Uh, and after that, I finally, I went, end up going to New York, actually to New York State, to work on my first diorama off the island uh, in New York State for the State Museum. In, and that was an interesting learning curve also. Well, speaking of all you learned here and all of the firsts that you figured out, um, you've mentioned that you and some others had gone to an international museum conference. And tell folks what oh, happened yeah. when, you, what, what, when you walked in the room. Right, right. We, uh, three of us were sent from the museum here in, in Victoria to go and study uh, and have a look at other dioramas done in other museums. And the closest one that had big dioramas was the Denver Museum. And uh, so the three of us went. We didn't know that there was a museum conference going on at the time. And uh, as we were introduced into the room where there were lots of people uh, listening to someone talk, the whole audience stood up and gave us a standing in, uh, 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 ovation. It was just amazing. I couldn't believe it. And it was on the strength of having finished the street scene upstairs. Uh, that street, see, street scene up there was, in fact, um, had put this museum on the map. And uh, so we kind of, <laughs> we were surprised, but proud at the same time. Yeah, and you should be. They are, these, are, these are the pieces people love today. They love uh, Old Town. They love the dioramas. Mm -hmm. uh, and as I was saying, just that feeling of, actually being somewhere transported somewhere else when you when you mm -hmm. see these giant giant paintings mm -hmm. it's in fact that's what's the beauty of dioramas they they uh, propel the visitor into a wall that is a huge hole in space because until the painting put was put on it it was just a blank wall and to draw the visitors into is that is wonderful to do that. Right. Yeah, it is a wonderful transformation. Uh, there's a question here um, from mm -hmm. Lori, and Lori asks, what kind of pink is on the wall? Is it oils? Is it acrylic? No, it's acrylic. It's acrylic. It, <laughs> it would be somewhat difficult to paint a wall that is 92 feet and 16 feet high to, uh, with oil paint and not <laughs> get kind of overcome by the fumes. Yeah. <laughs> You know, so no, 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 it's acrylic. Besides acrylic is very forgiving. You make a mistake and you can cover up before anyone sees it. Mm. <laughs> and you can make big changes that you can do much quicker. You don't have to wait for anything to dry. Yeah. So it's great. Yeah, that's important. Um, oh, there's a question also about um, the dioramas. So looking at the seashore, this is questions referring mm -hmm. to the seashore diorama. Are the rocks that are in the front, are, were they made taken from the photographs you took up at Triangle Island? They were made by a, 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 the team, the team going out into a, an area where there were rocks, taking molds of those rocks, bringing them back in and then getting the uh, products out of those molds. Those are all fiberglass reproductions of actual rocks. 
yeah, as are almost all almost all the trees. Uh, there are one or two that are actually real, but there's no way anyone can tell which are the ones that are real. So no, yeah, it, yeah, you have to go knock on everything, and that's how you find out. That's correct, <laughs> and that's not allowed. Not allowed. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I have to ask you one more question um, mm -hmm. before we, we start to wrap up. Our time's almost over already. Yeah. Um, you you were telling me uh, when we had a chance to chat before that everyone had their favorite, favorite place to take a nap. You're working really long days. You've got lots of creativity that's zapping the energy out of you. So mm -hmm. you need to find that special nap spot. And I was wondering what your favorite nap place was. My <laughs> Okay, that's, and that is your question, not someone of my <laughs> co-workers, huh? <laughs> no, no, but I might ask them to ask the, answer the same question of the chat. They can say where they like to take a nap. <laughs> I had one particular spot, um, and uh, okay, it was in the mine. In the mine, there were areas there that if you really needed to take a break, that was the perfect space. Uh, but that's all I'm admitting to. <laughs> so thank you, Grant. Grant Hollins, who's watching. He said he liked to nap by the big cedar tree by the deer, probably behind oh, it. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> and Heather says it's ironic that you you go get a rest in a mine, you know, wherever the working in a mine and you're, you're getting oh, right. a nice rest there. <laughs> so Jan, what, right. you're still painting now, correct? Oh, yes. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Where can people Especially, see what you do? Where, well, with the, the uh, virus as wild as it is, most galleries are having a difficult time or not even showing. Um, and I haven't, I had a show last year up here in Port Alberni, which was very pleasant. Um, and I haven't really had a gallery for a long time. So I'm, <laughs> my paintings are piling up. My sons in Victoria, their walls are filled. Uh, a lot of my friends have bought bought them, which is nice, um, but they are piling up. Mm -hmm. But you know, what else would you do? I mean, you, it has nothing on television. Um, and I'm not a reader, I'm more visually oriented. So I paint and it's perfect. I have absolutely no complaints. Wonderful. Hey, I, mm -hmm. think, do you, I think you too have a website. I know it, it's kind of in the, in the works. It's been so fun. I'm right now on Instagram. I have that's where I show most of my paintings, as some of my co-workers are doing. Um, and but that's pretty much it. Mm -hmm. Well, I know as you're saying, we've just popped you up here. We found you um, on your website www.yandreason.com, uh -huh. and you can see some of Yan's work. You've gone back to abstract, yes. I switch back and forth. I get to a point with abstracts where I'm, I need something more structured. And that's when I start painting landscapes for myself. And landscapes are easier. People reach landscapes easier than they do with abstracts. And so, um, yeah, um, I switch back and forth. Whenever I'm tired with one end, then I'll go to the other. Mm. Uh, and which is wonderful because I'm, at one point in my life, that was all I was going to do, just abstract paintings. But then, you know, life pushes you into all kinds of directions. And, and you say yes to all kinds of opportunities. Which, oh, um, yeah. That's why I'm telling my boys that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, don't say no. Go for yeah. it. You can only fail. Here is something you didn't know you could do, and, and you set a world standard for how it's done today so <laughs> well, thank you I don't know about that. <laughs> we we still hear we still get a lot of praise for these uh, beautiful beautiful exhibits well thank well, you again so much you're welcome oh thank you so much for joining us and um folks if you joined late or you missed something or you want to go back uh, this has been recorded and you can find mm -hmm. it on the royal bc museum's youtube channel so have a look there uh, the museum has opened our new feature exhibition, Orcas, Our Shared Future. And if you live locally, we encourage you to find out about time tickets on our website. And if you don't live locally, we're doing lots of virtual opportunities as well. Our next RBCM at Home is on May 25th with author Helen Deniers and the Daughters of Ruby Peter. And it's about the Royal BC Museum's newest publication, What Was Said to Me.
Uh, later today, uh, to further celebrate International Museums Day, we're having Museums Unite at 1 p.m. Chris will be taking a cross-country trip where we'll see highlights of other museums, uh, provincial museums uh, right across the, the country. And tonight at 11 p.m., uh, maybe check out what happens behind the scenes at the museum late at night. Uh, you can join us on that as well. And tickets are also available on the museum's website. Thank you, everyone. I hope you can join us at one of our upcoming events. And until then, take care of yourselves and one another. Bye-bye. <laughs> Are you yeah, still so, there? Yeah, don't run away on me, Jan, because uh, mm. 